It's where a mother hears the first notes of her baby's cry. The drones and beeps of life-giving machines are reminders of human fragility. A blur of nurses and doctors race to attend patients, giving families hope and comfort. It's where stories unfold, many with endings yet to be written. In thousands of towns and cities around the world, the hospital is the heartbeat of the community. We may pass it by on our way to the grocery store without giving it a second thought, or have had occasion to visit family or friends who were patients. But what do we know about its inner workings? This is The Power to Heal. This episode is supported by the Peace Arch News, the voice of White Rock and South Surrey since 1976. In this series of podcasts, we'll focus on the many innovative ways Peace Arch Hospital, located in White Rock, British Columbia, Canada, has been an integral part of its community. We'll talk to those who were instrumental in creating new initiatives for the hospital to grow and evolve along with the town it served. We bring you stories that'll raise a few eyebrows and prompt a response of, really, they did that? Let's go back to 1954. W.A.C. Bennett is the leader of British Columbia. We have unofficially here 358.9. The Miracle Mile was run at the Commonwealth Games in Empire Stadium. I promise you, you'll go a long, long time before you see another event like that. And in August of that year, Peace Arch Hospital opened its doors with 45 beds, five doctors, and 10 nurses. Longtime White Rock resident and veteran television and radio broadcaster Wayne Cox has a long history with Peace Arch Hospital. I've been a resident of South Surrey White Rock area for about 40 years. I've seen a big change in the hospital over those years. And that change is continuing with the addition of a new ER and some new operating rooms. Well, one of the biggest benefits that I can see was the creation of the Peace Arch Hospital Foundation. And thanks to that foundation, a lot of the medical equipment keeps getting updated. New state-of-the-art equipment being added all the time, and it's all right here in our neighborhood. With the entire world fully entrenched in Zoom get-togethers, Wayne connected with the executive director of Peace Arch Hospital Foundation, Stephanie Beck, and ER physician Dr. Jared Hendry to share a few stories that help us understand how Peace Arch Hospital Foundation came to be in the White Rock, South Surrey area, and to talk about how COVID has impacted the ER and how the staff at Peace Arch Hospital has responded. Stephanie, I'd like to talk about the foundation's role at Peace Arch Hospital and, of course, the effect that COVID has had. But maybe you could start just talking about uh, Peace Arch Hospital Foundation and its relationship with Fraser Health. Peace Arch Hospital Foundation was established in 1988, and it was a result of the government transitioning away from hospital societies that oversaw individual hospitals and moving more towards a regional authority model. So Peace Arch Hospital sits in the Fraser Health Authority, which is the largest health authority in BC, serving over 1.8 million people. It's also the 20th biggest hospital authority or health authority, pardon me, in Canada. So Peace Arch Hospital fits in that particular authority as one of 12 acute care sites. And the Hospital Foundation primarily fundraises for this particular site, both its campus and its equipment. And then we also fund a number of preventative health initiatives into our community. And thus, our name is Peace Arch Hospital and Community Health Foundation, because we believe in supporting both of those areas of health care in our community, both the hospital site and the actual community itself. And as I understand it, there's a government health budget, but the foundation tries to fill a gap because the budget can't take care of everything. So there, I, I'm sure there are just a few little things that the foundation can help out with. Is that how it works? There is a huge gap in terms of funding for new and replacement equipment, medical equipment in the health authorities. Such a gap that it cannot be made up even with all of the foundations fundraising together to try and minimize that gap. 
So what happens is the health authority obviously pays for operating expenses and for the basic essentials at a hospital. But if we want to have specialized or the most modern up-to-date equipment, then that's where the foundations step in. As we listen to Stephanie's explanation for the need to fundraise, we discover the need for state-of-the-art equipment encompasses far more than patient care. That's where our foundation steps in as well, to really try and provide the most up-to-date state-of-the-art equipment because it works for us in two ways. One, it attracts the physicians to our site if we've got the most up-to-date and technologically advanced equipment because of course who wants to work with old tech nobody does right so <laughs> being able to provide the newest equipment that reduces wait times for our clients our patients is of course something that everybody wants to see happen so there's a definite gap there which the foundations embark to overcome by fundraising for certain pieces of equipment and then putting that in the hands of our medical technicians so that they're able to speedily access or assess our patients and get them back on the road to recovery. So that's the gap that the foundations fill. And it's a lot of work. Shifting from the Peace Arch Hospital Foundation, we turn our attention to the department so many of us are all too familiar with for so many reasons, the emergency department. Dr. Hendry, you're in one of the busiest spots in the whole hospital, the emergency ward. And uh, being an ER physician, something that jumped out at me, I didn't realize that 99% of admissions to Peace Arch Hospital come through the emergency room. That's a very busy place then. Yeah, yeah. In most cases, the emergency departments in all the hospitals, especially in the lower mainland where you've got big populations, it's sort of a combined factor of family doctors. There's only so many that can see patients, especially under the current circumstances, but they're very hardworking. And then all the other people who have everything that they're unable to see their family doctor for, as well as all those emergencies. It's the person who falls down and breaks a wrist or uh, with every activity, there's unfortunately an accident that can happen. So that's where we sort of get all that chest pains, shortness of breath, broken bones. We're one of the, with us and family doctors are the few specialties that are really what we call generalists. We'll take anything and everything that comes in the door. So you have to be a bit of an adrenaline junkie, I think, to work in there because you have to, <laughs> you have to try to control chaos continually because you never know what's going to come in the door and you don't know whether it's a, a stub toe uh, or is it someone in cardiac arrest? It goes that wide. We see 99% of the admissions come through our department. Well, I've come through and your I, department and I've been very, very glad that you were there. I'll tell you that. <laughs> we're used to seeing anything and everything. And that's what's part of it as a professional. That's what's part of the fun. Because you and, never know what you're going to get. And you know, the, the, the population here in the peninsula is is growing so quickly. You must have seen quite a strain on your department. And I imagine that's why the new ER is in the works. Yeah. I mean, I started in Peace Search in 2004, and I think we were seeing about 20,000 patients a year. Hmm. And now we're somewhere up around almost 60,000. Wow. So it's a huge jump. The size of the department has expanded quite a bit, but relative to the number of patients we have, I believe it's somewhere in the 150 patients a day with all the congestion, the hospitals are full, trying to move patients away, especially under the current conditions of trying to maintain sterile techniques and isolation just makes it, let's say, that much more interesting in the eMERGE. I was going to ask you uh, how COVID has affected your line of work. It must be staggering sometimes. It is. My wife's an eMERGE nurse as well. Oh. <laughs> so I've seen it from her side and from mine. And it's the beginning. It was the constant change for eMERGE people who are used to working in there. It is just a bit of trying to control the chaos continually while you're, while you're in there. And then when you throw in, you thought you knew most of the medical aspect, the, you had the education and everything behind you to, to help you at least 
guide you what you were going to do with individuals medically. And then you throw in a medical unknown like COVID and all the protocols that came in, the guidelines that came in, it was literally a daily change of all the protocols that you knew we're continually used to just jumping into stuff, start doing CPR, start trying to help someone stop bleeding. COVID-19 began to take its toll on the staff at Peace Arch Hospital. Dr. Henry explains. You didn't know whether you could get infected by jumping into something too quickly and causing harm to yourself. And even for me, and I would believe for most of my colleagues, it wasn't necessarily a worry for ourselves. It was for our families, for our kids. And that just threw a whole wrench in the system. We're used to doing things to people and literally dealing with life and death. And it threw a whole nother stress that we'd never known before. So it was a, it was a big, big change. You'd see a couple a week, and then it became three, four a week. Recently, it was getting every day, and you'd admit three or four patients a day. The thing that really changed as well over time is at the beginning, it was elderly individuals, late 70s, 80s, uh, those people who had multiple comorbidities. As they got vaccinated and the numbers sort of reduced in that population, then it really changed. And especially more recently, it changed to people between 30 and 50. Hmm. And this is actually the most recent in this third wave is where definitely seeing far, far higher numbers, seeing five, six, seven patients a day, as well as admitting two or three of them a day because they had oxygen requirements and weren't able to basically breathe because of the all the operations all the elective operations all the elective uh, mris all the ct scans everything got stopped yeah literally march 15th 2020 it all just came to a dead stop in a second so now when they're playing catch up they're putting anything and everything because we are we're hospitals run 24 7. COVID aside, the Hospital Foundation continues to fundraise and achieve its goals. As we heard from Dr. Henry, the emergency department has been in dire need of upgrades. Executive Director of the Peace Arch Hospital Foundation, Stephanie Beck, shares the fundraising results. Well, our fundraising for the ER is complete. The uh, actual announcement and approval of the new ER came to us in 2015 with the ministry and government giving their approvals. We had been fundraising long before that, and we raised $15 million towards that project. And that's where something interesting happened in about 2016, 2017, we had the CEO of Fraser Health come to us and say, hey, you know, while we're building the ER, it makes sense to put some new ORs on top of this building because oh. our ORs were built in 1968 and they only had minor renovations since then. And of course, with today's technological advances, all of the uh, equipment booms and the monitors and surgical equipment wasn't really able to fit into those operating rooms any longer. So. Mm. He came to us and asked our board for support and our board jumped at the opportunity to be able to participate in this particular project. As it turned out, luck was on their side and Peace Arch Hospital got more than they originally bargained for. They immediately resolved that we would participate by gifting $22 million towards the new ORs to Fraser Health in partnership with the Ministry of Health to get the ORs built. And so they really rapidly moved with a business case on the new ORs. It did delay our ER by a little bit, but it gained us five brand new operating suites above the uh, ER. So we just recently came out of a $12 million public capital campaign for funding for a portion of the ORs, which we successfully completed thanks to our very generous community who really believe in this hospital and really have ownership over this hospital and want to make sure that health services are offered close to home where they live. So we're really appreciative of their support for this project. 
That's a tremendous amount of money. Uh, doctor, I imagine you submitted your wish list for this new new emergency <laughs> room, correct? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how did you make out on that wish list? <laughs> it's been a, a huge thing to see. I mean, the, the new emerge is hugely required. And I, I, I was the head of the department when they originally announced the creating the new emerge and was involved with that creation. And then seeing when they added the operating rooms, it made sense because as you said, 99% of the admissions come through the emerge. So as the emerge expands, we see that the requirements for the surgeons for on average radiology gets an imaging study for every patient that comes through the emergency department. So it means if we expand and we improve that, everywhere else in the hospital is going to get that same requirement for an increase. And talking to my colleagues in surgery, they definitely needed that. Stephanie, the foundation's always making improvements to the hospital. And what recent equipment purchases have made the greatest impact? Well, over the last year with the onset of COVID, of course, there was an out pouring of support from our community to help with any equipment that could support in the fight against COVID and to keep patients comfortable. So a number of our fundraising initiatives over the last year have been around COVID and various pieces of equipment. And we needed to purchase vital sign monitors for the hospital, for the COVID testing site and for the units, because where you normally could have had a vital sign monitor that could go from patient to patient, they were finding that that was uh, a, a way that COVID could be transmissible from patient to patient. So they were now asking for individual uh, vital signs monitors for each patient so they wouldn't have to be used amongst a cohort of patients. Same for slings. The slings that move patients from the bed to the wheelchair or the bed into the bath, those were all being shared amongst a patient group. So, of course, now we were asked, you know, can you buy the individual slings so that each patient has their own sling with their own name on it? And, of, of course, we did that. We purchased iPads and had a fundraising drive for iPads so that our patients could visit with loved ones over FaceTime or Skype or Zoom. So that was really a vital connector between our patients and their families, both in long-term care and in all of our acute beds as well. Always forward thinking and looking to the future, the foundation took a bold step into the high-tech world of robotics. And one of the fun things that we bought <laughs> is a UVGI robot which basically uh, blasts UVGI light into a patient's room, not when they're in it, of course, but when they're cleaning, and uh, it kills bacteria and viruses as well. So we had a community naming contest, and I think uh, the name that one was Zappy. So we used that uh, UVGI robot disinfecting unit, not only in our hospital, but also at the Peace Arch Hospital Foundation Lodge, which is our residential care building and hospice building. So, you know, every time there's a transfer of patients, this unit is very very well used and helps us in the fight against the transmission of the virus. So those are some of the things that we've been busy working on this last year. That's exciting. But more than just robots, the foundation is looking to make many more advancements into the future of Peace Arch Hospital. We're really excited about what's coming down the pipe for us here at Peace Arch Hospital. Uh -huh. So for instance, our staff is busy working on a medical imaging campaign because we have to have a look at our MRI, our fluoroscopy unit and our digital x-ray because all of those pieces of equipment have reached their lifespan already. So we're going to be fundraising for some of those new medical technologies. We're also looking forward to working in partnership with Fraser Health in building a new ICU for our site as well, which will of course be built with all of the newest protocols around infectious diseases and viruses within our hospital. So lots of exciting things planned for our future. Peace Arch Hospital has a long and storied history in White Rock. The ability to even get the hospital built came from the generosity of a donor. 
Let's hear Stephanie as she tells us the story. In the late 1940s after the war, the Royal Columbian Hospital put out an ad in a newspaper in Surrey saying that they were no longer interested in having Surreyites come to their hospital to be treated as patients. Really? So that, of course, uh, caused a flurry of activity in Surrey as to what to do and, and where to build a hospital. So a society was formed, the hospital society was formed to figure out where exactly in Surrey a new hospital should be built. Well, as you can imagine, there was a lot of uh, tension between the South Surreyites and the North Surreyites, and that committee broke into two pieces or two committees. And we had the White Rock Committee and we had the North Surrey Committee. Ultimately, the White Rock Committee was able to get a grant from the government to build Peace Arch Hospital back in the early 1950s, but they had to come up with 50% of the costs themselves. So back then, that was $150,000. Really? So then the fundraising really began in our community in the late 40s and early 50s to build our hospital. Luckily, a woman by the name of Amy Weatherby stepped forward and she donated the five and a half acres of land that our campus now sits on. So that was a wonderful donation. Of course, you can imagine back in those days, this entire corridor of North Bluff Road or 16th Avenue was just bush and trees. But we did get that hospital open in 1954 with 45 beds and it was a great day for our community. It had the only working elevator in town. <laughs> And the kids would have school field trips to come and ride the elevator up and down. <laughs> so we have a really great history here in White Rock and a lot of our residents really feel attached to our hospital. A population increase. You, you mentioned that, Doctor, here on the peninsula. It seems to be skewing younger. The White Rock, South Surrey area for the longest time seemed to be a retirement haven for British Columbia. But now with all these new families moving in, the whole demographic shift must be a challenge for you too. Yeah, absolutely. Traditionally for years, it's always been that our highest proportion has been 70 and above throughout FHA. Ours was the, the highest percentage for our whole population. And you can definitely see it on a day-to-day -day basis. The number of small kids coming in on a daily basis is definitely increasing. And I mean, part of it is because we're getting, you know, even physicians were being able to recruit because of things that the foundation has done, getting new equipment. I mean, I got to admit, that's the reason my wife and myself moved out here was because I got a full-time position at a place where the foundation was backing what we were doing and giving us the equipment that we wanted. And we've, we've gotten other young physicians working in my department now that it's the reason they came out here. Got two of them that one's an eMERGE physician and his wife's a family doctor. Hmm. And it's fun for us uh, to see the kid. Uh, you don't want to ever <laughs> see a kid in the emergency department, mm -hmm. but it's fun for us to keep up our skills and, and uh, see all kinds of things. Well, Dr. Hendry and Stephanie Beck, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a lot of fun. It's been very interesting. And it's exciting times for not only the hospital, but for the foundation, too. And thank you for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Always innovating, always changing with the times. The story of the Peace Arch Hospital Foundation has many chapters. This podcast introduced us to the foundation, and it brought us to a new understanding of the challenges brought on by COVID-19 to the emergency department and to healthcare in general. We're thrilled to bring you this story. Innovation comes to life in so many ways at the Peace Arch Hospital Foundation. During the summer, we invite you to support the efforts in the purchase of a new bronchoscope. The deadly global COVID-19 pandemic has put significant stress on Peace Arch Hospital this year. I'm sure you can imagine how tough it's been on their local medical teams, patients, and families. But we remain hopeful, and I've got some exciting news for you. There's a new piece of equipment available that will help Peace Arch Hospital diagnose critically ill patients with or recovering from COVID-19. It will also help manage complications such as bleeding of the lungs, lung collapse, or worse. This wonderful device is called a bronchoscope, and it's used by doctors, 
respiratory therapists, and pulmonologists to detect the cause of breathing difficulties and lung problems like COVID-19. It also helps manage issues such as tumors, infection, and bleeding, and helps medical teams monitor a patient's breathing when they're using an artificial airway during intubation or tracheostomy. Any gift, no matter the size, can make a massive impact and help purchase this critical piece of equipment. Learn more or make a gift online today at pahfoundation.ca slash give. That's pahfoundation.ca slash give. You can find additional information on the Peace Arch Hospital Foundation website. This is the power to heal. This episode is supported by the Peace Arch News, the voice of White Rock and South Surrey since 1976. Next, we'll discover how one of the most exciting care facilities came about. The Peace Arch Hospital Foundation Lodge is perhaps one of the most groundbreaking facilities in BC's Lower Mainland. Join us next time as Wayne chats with Art Reitmeyer, a former board member that brought the dream of a new home at Peace Arch Hospital for seniors and palliative care patients to life.